Good evening, listener. Thanks for joining us. But a uh, word of warning. If you're looking for fairy tales and bedtime stories, you've come to the wrong place. But if you enjoy it when your blood runs cold, if the feeling of being followed and watched makes you feel alive, well then, come on in, turn on all your lights, get cozy, and settle in as master storyteller Otis Jiry weaves tales of terror for your entertainment. But there's still time if you'd like to turn back. Ah, still here. Good, good. Who needs sleep anyway? You're listening to Horror Story Time. Please welcome your host and the star of this series, Master Storyteller Otis Jiry. The Woman in the Niqab by Lindsay Goddard If you're reading this email, you've been selected as the new night auditor at the Ladford Inn. Congratulations, well, I suppose. My memories of the hotel are mostly fond ones, with the exception of my final week when I decided I'd rather take my chances in the unemployment line. Here's to hoping you're spared the misery of the chilling encounters which sent me running from the Ladford, with my pride dragging behind me like a dead dog. I didn't put in the proper two weeks' notice when I resigned from my position, a grievance which Eleanor was quick to air, as tends to be the case with most of Eleanor's grievances. On her bad days, she comes off as a real ice queen. Those steely blue eyes could shatter diamonds if she concentrated hard enough, I'm certain. But don't be fooled. Deep down, she's a real softy. She insisted I write this letter since I left you with little or no training. How can I refuse? She owns four hotels and personally manages each one, and I understand her concerns with making sure you receive proper training because, quite simply, she's too busy to deal with it. She never sits still. She's all business, and I'd hate to play cards with a woman because she's got a poker face to rival all others. I've seen her use it in response to difficult customers in a hotel drama, all of which you'll come to know too well. She uses it in other circumstances, too, like when I think she's caught a glimpse of the Ladford's unwelcome guest, the tortured woman who now haunts my dreams. I once asked Eleanor if she's seen anything strange. She donned that poker face and shook her head, and I couldn't tell if her response was genuine or a bluff. The slightest wrinkle of fear crossed her brow, though, and it whispered, Yes, I've seen her. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's back up. Eleanor has been my supervisor for more than five years. Despite her tough exterior, she's always shown me kindness, which is why I agree to write this letter. She asked me to give you some pointers and share with you, my predecessor, all the expert advice I've gathered in half a decade on the job. This isn't going to be that sort of letter. If Eleanor had chosen you for the position, I'm sure you're plenty bright and capable of handling things on your own. Besides, there's something more important I need to tell you. Forget about room keys and guest service for a moment. I need to warn you about the woman in the niqab. Three weeks ago, a Pakistani man by the name of Samir Ahmad came to stay at the hotel after arriving in the States. The construction of his new home was running behind. It would be several days before it was finished and ready to pass inspection. He was stuck in limbo between his old home in Pakistan and his newly built American mansion. He would paid good money, more money than I could dream of spending on a house, and he was furious at the situation. The spoiled son of an oil company CEO, he didn't care for the public aspect of a hotel, sickened by the inconvenience of being forced to lay his head where so many others had laid theirs. He let his frustration show, always tense, biding his time with every painstaking tick of the clock. His dark eyes twitched when he spoke, his bronzed complexion flush with impatience. 
He had an assistant by the name of Tahir, a short Pakistani man, very soft-spoken and polite, though his English was broken. Tahir was not staying at our five-star hotel, but rather a ramshackle motel several blocks east, as his employer saw fit. He had dark circles under the dark circles in his eyes, and I was certain it was from dealing with the stressful antics of Mr. Ahmed. The wife, Mrs. Ahmed, remained a mystery to me throughout her two-week stay. I never learned her first name, never dared to ask. She did not converse with men outside her immediate family, only occasionally whispering in her husband's ear. She most likely didn't know a word of English. With no reason to establish a first-name basis between the two of us, I accepted her as a blank slate, an unknown guest. But after so many years of getting to know my guests on a personal level in order to better accommodate their needs, I admit it felt odd to have this one slip through my fingers. You know how skimpy clothing is often referred to as leaving nothing to the imagination? Well, Mrs. Ahmed's wardrobe left everything to the imagination. I was familiar with such cultural garments from textbooks, television, and newspapers, but I'd never seen one close up. A niqab, that's what they're called. A black veil concealed the entirety of her face. It covered her eyebrows and even the bridge of her nose. The eye slits were narrow, and I remember thinking it would drive me nuts to have all that cloth in my peripheral vision. A headdress draped her shoulders and hung down her back, and not a single strand of hair could be seen. I hid my discomfort as best I could, mindful not to hurt the feelings of the woman beneath the shroud. Different strokes for different strokes, I always say. I noticed that even her fingers were hidden beneath gloves. Her hands left no prints where she leaned up on the counter, and I thought she might as well be a ghost. It was a perfectly innocent thought, which seemed so ominous in retrospect. I made sure to smile at the woman every evening as she came to get a bucket of ice. I wished to make her feel as comfortable as possible. The move from overseas was a huge one. I imagine adjusting to the change in culture was exhausting. I have no way of knowing if she smiled back, but a couple of times she nodded in my direction before hurrying over to the ice machine. I assume Mr. Ahmed had some personal use for the ice, as he would yell for her to hurry up if she took a few seconds too long. Perhaps he needed to soak his feet in a cold bath after a full day of pacing back and forth and placing angry phone calls to the real estate agent. One thing is for sure, his wife was never fast enough. In a gruff foreign tongue, he barked at her from down the hall, and although I did not understand his words, they couldn't strike me as particularly encouraging. Two nights before Samir Ahmed checked out of the hotel and headed for his newly built mansion, the woman in the niqab encountered a problem on her nightly run to the lobby. Out of order was scrawled on a sheet of paper and taped to the machine, written with red permanent marker in all capital letters. The daytime clerk had scheduled a repair for the following day and scribbled a post-it note to me, which now clung to the front desk, drawing my attention with a nauseating shade of yellow. Mrs. Ahmed couldn't read the out-of-order sign, of course, but at a glance at the empty tray and a few unresponsive clicks of the button told her everything she needed to know. She hung her head in defeat, hugging the empty bucket to her black-clad bosom. I was quick to respond. Mrs. Ahmed, I said, addressing her directly for the first time since she had arrived, I can help with that. I pointed to the bucket in her gloved hands. I approached, and as I did, her eyes widened like a cornered mouse. Then something very unexpected happened. I saw beauty in those eyes. It struck me. It held me captive. Her eyes were not brown as I had imagined the countless times she averted her gaze, but a brilliant shade of amber which shined like bowls of honey in the sunlight. I reached for the bucket in a cautious, I come in peace, gesture. I was taken aback by her gorgeous orbs, and she by my close proximity. She loosened her grip and let me remove the bucket from her fingers. I ran to the employee lounge, moving quickly as I knew her ticking time bomb husband would run out of patience soon. I filled it and returned to the lobby even faster than I departed. She was standing in the exact same spot, 
a motionless Nakabi mannequin until she nodded her thanks to me. I held the bucket a moment longer and gazed into those lovely eyes. I held the bucket a moment longer and gazed into those lovely eyes. Amber is a rare color, the color of my first girlfriend's eyes, the thought of whom still causes my heart to race. I was irresistibly drawn to that color. We plan to have the ice machine fixed by tomorrow evening, I said. I was stalling, though I wasn't sure why. There's another one on the second floor if you need it. Recalling our language barrier, I frowned. Pieces of ice fell to the carpet as I handed the silent woman her bucket, now brimming with frozen cubes. Then I noticed Mr. Ahmed, six doors down, his head poking into the hall. His olive complexion was flushed with blood as he observed our one-sided conversation with an unpleasant scowl. I immediately turned and made a beeline for the desk, hoping I hadn't caused the woman any troubles. Thirty minutes later... I received a noise complaint from room 110. A middle-aged businesswoman by the name of Susan Bennett had been staying in 110. She was a quiet, introverted woman. She tipped the staff well and kept her room tidy without much help from housekeeping. She didn't strike me as a prankster, so I believed her when she told me she'd heard horrible screams coming from the next room. I was suddenly tense, an icy knot formed in my stomach. My mouth went dry and all I could do was force a small amount of saliva down my throat and try to locate my voice. Needless to say, I had a bad feeling about Mrs. Bennett's noise complaint. Had the screams come from Mrs. Abed in 112? Was she in some kind of trouble with her husband? I couldn't help but wonder, did I cause a fight between them? I didn't think such an innocent encounter would cause marital tension— but the look on Samir's face had been so angry. I assured Mrs. Bennett I would look into the matter, confirm the time of her wake-up call while I had her on the line, and bid her good night and sweet dreams. Beads of sweat formed on my brow as I met her way down the hall. The couple who had stayed in room 108 had checked out this morning, and no one else had rented the room. The noises must have come from 112. I approached the door and knocked, lightly at first. Nobody answered. I knocked again, this time speaking through the wall as well. Mr. Ahmed, it's hotel management. Uh, we'd like to make sure everything is all right. I heard him unlock the deadbolt and fasten the latch. He opened the door about two inches and peered through the crack. The metal latch prevented it from opening any further. Mr. Ahmed was breathing hard. Perspiration moistened his forehead and his black hair glistened like an oil slick. All is fine, he bluntly assured me. I tried to peer over his shoulder into the room, but he deliberately filled every inch of the opening and cleared his throat as if to say, Get on with it. What is this about? A guest reported hearing a scream through the walls. I was worried Mrs. Ahmed may have taken a fall or twisted her ankle. All is fine, he repeated, glaring at me with dark eyes. He began to close the door. May I see her, I asked, you know, just to follow up, to close the report. He stopped and flashed me an insulted expression. She is not veiled. No visitors. You can close the report. He shut the door in my face. The next evening, I waited for the woman with the gorgeous amber eyes to fetch her husband some ice. Hours ticked by, and she never showed. I sat alone at the desk, reading a novel and trying not to notice the absence of a certain shrouded lady. I rubbed my arms, warming them against a chill that had lingered in the lobby all night. No matter how I adjusted the thermostat, a cold draft remained, coaxing my body hair on end like a snake charmer. I thought maybe I was coming down with a virus, because I started getting really cold to the point where I started to shiver. For a moment, I thought the woman in the niqab must have slipped past me as I was reading my book because the ice machine grumbled to life. I looked up, and nobody was there. The loan machine hurled ice cubes with a steady clink, clink, clink. It seemed louder than it ever had before, and worked aggressively, shaking back and forth as it spewed chunks of frozen water into an overflowing tray. I raised an eyebrow as I watched this mechanical wonder, an appliance that turned on by itself and whipped itself into a frenzy. Eh, some repairman, I mumbled. I pulled a bookmark from the drawer, set it in place, and closed the book. I could hardly concentrate with all the racket, 
Besides, I needed to unplug the blasted thing before the carpet got riddled with puddles. When I returned my attention to the lobby, Mrs. Ahmed was standing there. The silhouette of a robe-like dress and loose veil stuck out from behind the machine. The shapeless black figure stood stock still, mostly hidden by the possessed ice machine as it turned out cube after cube. Ma'am? I rounded the desk and approached her. I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with this machine. I thought we had it fixed, but it's not, and... I stopped in my tracks and began to look away. In the harsh fluorescent lighting, which Eleanor despises for the way it illuminates every speck of dirt, I tried to make out a woman's form beneath the garment. It hung loose down to the ankle-length hemline, but eventually my eyes found the shape of a human figure inside. Yet the fact remained that it was floating, not standing, suspended somehow mid-air. Where usually she wore dark sandals and socks, there were no feet, and that long black dress looked menacing as it hovered against the off-white walls, inches above the carpet facing me. The air grew colder as I looked up, searching for an explanation in her amber eyes. What I saw snatched the breath from my lungs in one fell swoop of terror. Her veil was in place, tucked inside her head garb like it always was, the same narrow slits for the eyes, only she had none. No eyes at all, nothing but darkness where they used to be. The ice machine rumbled and roared, propelling my hysteria to new heights as she reached a gloved hand to her face. She wrapped her fingers around the veil and peeled it away. The face of nothingness stared back at me. An empty void inside the niqab. The lights clicked off without any theatrics, no exploding bulbs or popping circuits. They didn't so much as flicker, just instant blackness. My jaw chattered, as the chill increased triplefold. When I couldn't take it any more, I closed my eyes and whimpered. I stayed that way, eyes squeezed shut like a dope until the ice machine ceased its psychotic production. The buzzing of the fluorescence returned, and I could see the light shining through my eyelids. I opened them, and she was gone. I looked around, relieved no guests had witnessed my cowardice, but at the same time disappointed I was alone. Nobody was going to believe me, I knew. My only evidence was a mountain of ice on the floor, a mess which would only get worse the longer I waited to clean it up. I barely dragged myself into work the next night. I was wired on coffee, after tossing and turning to no avail. Heavy gray bags under my eyes made me look like a washed-up rock star, only I lack a rock star's edge. I felt scared and alone. I have close friends and family I could talk to, but I was afraid to tell anyone about my frightening encounter for fear of what they might think. As adults, we tell ourselves that the boogeyman isn't real. The monsters in our closet were long ago exposed as frauds. There's not a blood-covered ghost in the mirror waiting for us to say her name three times. We tell ourselves that the deceased go to a better place, and miraculously... They all managed to get there with no trouble, as there are certainly no lost souls among us. We consider people who believe in the boogeyman to be crazy, or at least we call them names like weird and flaky. That's why I decided to keep this to myself. Though I had never been so scared in my life, I didn't let it show. I went about my usual routine. The hotel was busier than usual, but the moments I spent alone seemed to drag on forever. I did inventory to keep my mind busy, to avoid thinking about the invisible woman, the lady who wasn't there, whose familiar clothes floated in the air as if watching me with unseen eyes. My skin grew cold each time I thought about the frigid air that swirled around her. I looked through the front windows as a taxi pulled to the curb, and to my shock, Samir Ahmed emerged from the car with his wife. Yes, the elusive Mrs. Ahmed followed close behind him. I'll admit I was ecstatic to see her, if a little worried about my sanity. I had worked myself into a frenzy, thinking something had happened to her, and after seeing those terrible things, it was a mixture of satisfaction and confusion to see her walking toward me now. The revolving glass door caught the red glow of the taxi's taillights, 
as they entered the building with Samir in the lead. It was close to his usual bedtime, and I figured they were returning from a late dinner at a crowded restaurant. I had to suppress a smile as I envisioned the impatient millionaire forced to wait for his meal, though my smile faded as I wondered how Mrs. Ahmed managed to eat through that veil. He approached the desk and proceeded to inform me that this would be his final night at the Ladford. His new home was ready. He'd be leaving in the morning and needed a luggage rack promptly at seven. The moment he looked away, I stole a glimpse at his wife. Just one last look to commit to those gorgeous amber eyes to memory. I feared I had suffered a mental collapse, and I was hoping to replace the image of the floating macabre and its empty veil with something more palatable. But what I saw made things worse. It sent a jolt of shock to my heart. Her black veil was in place, with the same rectangular slits for the eyes. But the woman's eyes had changed. They were different. No longer the glistening pools of honey I admired two nights prior. Her dark brown eyes showed no signs of recognition as she observed me with indifference. The old Mrs. Ahmed had always averted her gaze. She never looked directly at me, not until the night by the ice machine. Yet those chocolate brown eyes studied me so alert, the wrong shape, the wrong color, the wrong personality. Imposter, I thought, but didn't say. He's replaced his wife, just like that. Replaced her. A chill crept down my spine. I willed it away, not allowing my body to betray my suspicions. I finished my business with Mr. Ahmed, and I avoided any further eye contact with the mysterious woman at his side. The loneliest part of the night shift comes around three in the morning. The drinkers and party animals have all gone to bed. The early risers have not yet risen. The ticking of the clock resonates in some deep part of the soul which wants, no, needs to be around people. Because anything can happen when you're alone. I was contemplating the woman in the cab and how she was not the same woman Samir Ahmed had arrived with several nights ago when the lights blinked off one by one. All around the lobby, bulbs flickered and went out. The hallway to the guest rooms was left in utter blackness. I remember noticing the other electronics were still working, the computer and the vending machine. I wondered what would cause the lights on several different circuits to fail. I felt a familiar chill in the air, a drop in temperature, which caused my jaw to chatter. The lobby became downright frigid, and my breathing grew heavy, despite my best efforts to keep calm. I scanned my surroundings, the vending area, the sofa and coffee table piled with magazines, the elevator, the hallway, the stairwell. I flicked my eyes from place to place and told myself the coast was clear, yet my eyes were drawn back to the hall. I gulped, and a wad of saliva stopped halfway down my throat. A nervous bile rose from my stomach. I tried to focus, to make sense of what I saw. There was something in the hall, someone, but they didn't walk upright, which is why I hadn't noticed them at first. Instead, they crawled through the darkness like a spastic inchworm, clawing at the carpet with spindly fingers. One good leg propelled them forward as the other dragged behind, seemingly useless below the knee, foot twisted sideways like a broken doll. Shadows contrasted the waxen skin and dark hair. The figure kept coming, scraping along the carpet like a wounded soldier through the dirt, and after a few seconds... I made out the face of a woman beneath her hair, which seemed to fall in every direction at once. Her neck was wrenched at a painful-looking angle, her scalp and face pointing the wrong way. Many of her bones were bent and twisted. Her advance was sketchy. Her joints popped with each movement, and her muscles strained, skin ripe with bruises. She pulled herself into the light of the vending machines, and I saw the blood crusted on her lips and skin, dark splotches down her chest. I had plenty of time to call for help, to run over and assist the injured woman. But I'm no fool. I may be a skeptic in matters of magic, demons, and astrology, but I recognize a ghost when I see one. Her raspy breathing caused me to hold up my own breath as she dragged herself into the lobby. She never looked at me, not once, and I must admit I was relieved. The only thing preventing me from running into the night screaming like a little girl was the lack of eye contact she had bestowed on me so far. 
The thought of this dead thing looking at me with those blackened eyes and acknowledging my existence, well, that would have been my final straw. But it didn't happen. Not even an upward glance. She kept crawling in that slow, labored manner until she had disappeared behind the sofa, leaving me to wonder what to do. I stood my ground, hoping the lights would flicker to life or the phone would ring, or a guest would come wandering down the hall. Anything, anything to end this moment. Every horror story must end, and I knew this wasn't over yet. I groaned. I couldn't stand in the dark forever, but this was her game, not mine. Why should I have to make the next move? I was scared dangerously close to wetting my pants. Half my attention was focused on my bladder, the other half on the sofa. When no light returned to the room and no guests appeared to run interference, I knew the ball was in my court. I gulped and stepped forward. The snack machine lit my path as I rounded the desk and made my way to the lounge area. I kept going around to the back of the sofa. Sitting in the soft glow of the soda machine was a large trunk I had never seen. It looked heavy, made from a solid wood craftsmanship that doesn't seem to exist anymore. Dark leather lined the surface with a metal latch in the middle and two belt-like straps on each side. I was certain it hadn't been there before. I spotted keyholes where the latches came together and I knew I couldn't open it. Fine with me. I didn't want to anyway. I turned and prepared to walk away and told myself three things. A. Someone had misplaced their luggage. B. I needed to see a shrink. And C. I needed to fix the lights before we received a complaint. The trunk began to rattle. I stopped in my tracks and listened. It was such a low rumble I was barely sure I heard it until the trunk started thumping and banging against the floor. I jumped and spun around and watched with uneasy fascination as it tremored, caught in the throes of a supernatural quake. The locks clicked and the leather straps danced as the trunk bucked wildly on the floor. Then it stopped. The metal clasps thudded against the lid and slid down the arc, dangling at the trunk's sides. All was quiet for a few panicked heartbeats, and then my ears picked up the sound of raspy, labored breathing coming from inside the trunk. It couldn't be, I told myself. She couldn't be in there. A person couldn't fit inside. Not unless... I froze as the realization struck me. Not unless they were stuffed inside like a rag doll, bones broken and bent at gruesome angles. Trembling, I closed the distance between myself and the trunk without any further hesitation. I knew what I must do, and frankly, I wanted to get it over with. I grimaced as I reached for the lid. I flipped it open. Her body was bent in half, limbs tangled in a gory mess. A splintered collarbone protruded from her purple and green splotched neck. She'd been crumpled up and stuffed into the trunk with no regard for broken bones. As I contemplated the twisted and turns of a woman's desecrated remains, she sprang to life. She grabbed me and started pulling, and to my horror I couldn't fend her off. This monstrous woman was incredibly strong. I remember worrying she would pull me down into the trunk, into the deep, dark oblivion of the empty niqab, the endless silence of her tortured unrest. Fingernails dug into my flesh as she tightened her grip. I recoiled from the stench of old blood on her breath as she sputtered and moaned in what sounded like Arabic. The grotesque angle of her battered face atop a twisted neck will never leave my mind. She pulled me close, so close, so that I was looking at her eyes. Amber eyes. The eyes of Mrs. Ahmed. The ice machine cranked to life, spewing forth its bounty. Pain shot through my skull as something rock-solid hit the back of my head. Stars and blackness filled my vision. I awoke on the floor next to the metal ice bucket. It must have been what hit me, hurled by the force of the broken woman in the box. The shape of the bucket's rim perfectly matched the fresh indent in my cranium. I looked around, but there was no sign of the trunk or its monstrous occupant. I shook the frog from my head, rubbed my eyes, and checked my wristwatch. With over two hours left and my last nerve dangling from a thread, I knew I needed to get out of the hotel. 
I couldn't think straight, couldn't relax, and worst of all, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I texted Eleanor and asked if she could cover the rest of my shift. It's an emergency, I said. I broke the news to her when she arrived. I was quitting. I wouldn't be back. She tried her best to guilt me, of course, but I'd made my mind up and no amount of shame would change it. I did return the next day, however, one last time. After restless hours in which I was unable to sleep, eat, or concentrate on anything other than thoughts of the ghost, I decided there was something I had to know. I apologized for my behavior and groveled and gained Eleanor's blessing to review the hotel's security footage. She didn't ask me what I was looking for. Eyes bright with denial, she donned that old, familiar poker face and silently assured herself that I was in need of a shrink or some antipsychotics. I spent two hours reviewing the surveillance footage, and here's what I found. On the last night of Mr. Ahmed's stay, he departed the building alone. There was no sign of the woman in the niqab until he returned with her hours later. She disappeared from the camera's footage after our encounter by the ice machine, only to reappear that strange, memorable night when I noticed her eyes had changed. I should also mention that there's no sign of the haunting images I'd seen. The footage does indeed show a malfunctioning ice machine and a baffled clerk, but not the floating figure in the niqab with emptiness where the face should be or the battered woman crawling down the hall into the trunk. The camera even blinked out right at the moment when the ice bucket hurled itself across the room, finding a target on the back of my skull. Rather frustrating, I'll admit, but I digress, because more disturbing than any of that was the footage of Samir Ahmed checking out the hotel. On the grainy TV screen, I watched as he grunted and steered a luggage cart himself. He shooed a bellboy aside who attempted to offer assistance and barked an order to his assistant, Tahir, who held open a set of double doors as Samir maneuvered the cart onto the sidewalk. His so-called wife brought up the rear of the group as Tahir held the door open for her, too. And that was the last I saw of the leather-bound trunk with its straps fastened tight and middle latch securely locked as it thumped along with the other baggage, hiding in the Pakistani millionaire's dirty laundry. I'm certain the person in the cab on this last piece of footage is not the real Mrs. Ahmed, but I'm alone in this knowledge. To be honest, I don't expect anyone to believe me. Unless you see her, the woman in the niqab who floats in her robes with no body and no face, a cold and beaten corpse who crawls the hallway and plays with electricity and throws metal buckets. But I wonder, is it just me? Am I the only one she haunts because I am the only one who noticed her existence and therefore her disappearance? Is she the ghost of a ghost? The memory of someone who was, but really was not? You'll have to answer that question. Can you do that? Can you write back to me, please? I I just, I need to know one way or the other. Whether I'm crazy or sane, I need to know if I bear this cross alone. So please, if you hear the clatter of ice cubes echoing through the empty lobby, if you catch a glimpse of her black robe around the corner, or see her broken body writhing on the carpet, be on guard, but please do not run. Stand your ground and face the darkness for me, because Eleanor is not going to believe you. No one is going to believe you, but I will. Nights at the Ladford End are lonely, and I know what it feels like to pace the floors, to watch the halls, to wonder if she's standing right behind you. Hi, Otis Jiry here. Thanks for joining me around the digital campfire today. Your support means everything to me. I wanted to take a moment to ask you to support me and help me make storytelling my career by joining the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights members area. There are links in the video description below. If you love what I do, help me make this my full-time job by signing up for any membership of your choice. With your support, I can quit my day job and dedicate my day to putting out more twisted tales more regularly and take more of your requests. With a membership, 
Not only do you get instant access to my archive of 200 plus audio stories in HD format, but you'll get them weeks or months before the public does. You'll also get access to the full archive of hundreds of fully produced Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's Tales, including several narrated by me, and advanced access there as well. In addition to that, you'll get exclusive members-only access to private monthly livestream events and direct access to me and the rest of the team via the Direct Connect and Production Lounge features, where you'll get the opportunity to let your voice be heard and get insider updates. Members will also get the opportunity to earn money by referring friends and family to us. So what are you waiting for? For as little as six sixty-six a month with an annual membership, you can help our channels grow and help me make my dream come true. So, thanks again for listening. And please consider giving up a cup of Starbucks or that pack of energy drinks to help this old storyteller live his dream. Visit us today at http colon slash slash www.chillingtalesfordarknights.com slash tour for information and sign up now.